Today we have another X570 motherboard review, though this time it's from Aorus with their X570 Pro Wi-Fi, except the one I have here on the test bench doesn't have Wi-Fi, and I'm told it doesn't have a price tag, so we're gonna treat it like it's the Wi-Fi, which is coming in at 269 USD, and if you're in Australia, 469 Aussie dollars. Now I know there's some people out there in the audience that are gonna be saying, give me the dates, give me the dates. And that's exactly what we're gonna be doing here today, going over the VRM, testing that with the 3900X at 4.3 gigahertz all core overclocks, and testing out onboard audio, testing out the NIC speeds, USB 3 speeds. And unfortunately though, since this board here doesn't have Wi-Fi, I can't test out the Wi-Fi speeds for you, but I would assume that they are all A-OK, -okay, or I mean a or so OK. And with that aside, let's check out this board. Welcome back to Tech Yes, and without wasting any more of your precious time, we've got a 14 phase VRM where 12 of the phases are doubled. That's for the CPU. So we're looking at a two by six solution there with the doubler being the Infineon IR3599. And then for the PWM controller, they're using the IR3521. Then for the MOSFETs, we've got the Dr. Moss direct drive MOSFETs. This is the Infineon IR PAL R stage 40 amp MOSFETs. And then for the SOC, they're using two direct phases. These are known as the PPAC 2H2L MOSFETs. Now for the chokes, these were a little bit of a tricky bugger to find some information on. From what I gather, they are TDK 50 amp inductors. And then for the capacitors, we're looking at APAC 5K capacitors. Now, of course, the main thing with the VRM is testing out the overclocks. And we've got here a 3900X juicing about 140 watts and this put on the heatsink a 52 degree surface temperature. None of the MOSFETs, I was reading 62 degrees. So everything is absolutely fine on this VRM. It'll be easily geared up towards the 3950X overclocked on air or water. And also in that regard, the heatsink itself has a fin design over the CPU VRM section and weighs in at 149 grams. Now, speaking of heatsinks, I've also got these over the two NVMe slots, which are PCIe 4x4 and testing out the speeds, they are absolutely fine. The heatsink weighs in at 31 grams. The temperatures with this heatsink on was 54 degrees on the surface and then 60 degrees in the software. Having no heatsink on in this board saw the temperatures on the surface go to 92 degrees and then 81 degrees in the software. This is repeatedly spamming it. And an odd thing about that too, is if you don't have the heatsink on, it will throttle. So it's highly advised to use the NVMe drive, especially on the PCIe Gen 4 solutions, with a heatsink on. So overall, the VRM on this board does check out, of course, what I've seen with the trend with the X570 boards and what I've at least spoken to with the motherboard manufacturers is they are simply over-engineered and they're all looking at high overclock 16 core in mind in terms of what they can support up to. So 3900X, just like the Tai Chi I recently reviewed, absolutely no problems on this board. You won't need any active cooling solution. Though on that note of active cooling solutions, there is a small fan on the platform chipset hub and I didn't report on this on the X570 Tai Chi review, so I'm sorry for that, I forgot. But the noise is so inaudible, so both Aorus on this board with the Pro Wi-Fi and also ASRock with their Tai Chi have done a good job of implementing something that is of low noise. Now, what about the onboard audio? Here they're using the Realtek ALC1220-VB, and I found with the frequency response curve, the numbers were absolutely phenomenal. Zero to 20 hertz, well, should I say zero to 10 hertz, only saw a negative two decibel drop off, and then between 10 and 20 hertz, saw literally like a 0 0.05 decibel drop off. So phenomenal figures. The rest of the line was pretty much flat throughout the whole frequency response curve with a little bit of a dip though from 10K to 20K of only about 0.2 decibels. So this solution will be pretty much great for powering any sorts of cans, whether they're mid-range, high-end, if they're not orthodynamics. I did try to use the headphone amplifier built in to power some orthodynamics and it was so close to getting them at least at a functional level. But unfortunately it was not to be quite yet. So if you do wanna power things like orthodynamics, I would recommend a discrete amp. Now, speaking of the crosstalk, this is phenomenal too. Minus 91 decibels and the 100 volume up to this level, there's absolutely no leakage whatsoever. So that is perfect. The balance between the left and right channels is also perfect. And then the mic import, at least for onboard audio, is the best I've seen yet 
with having absolutely no noise, even with noise suppression turned off, and that's bumping it up to 30 decibels, 100 volume. So basically this means you can use this for streaming or use it for audio recordings. Of course, if you do wanna step it up to a professional level, I would recommend getting a professional solution for recording. But as it stands, if you wanna stream on this mic import and play games with the audio out, it's gonna be absolutely phenomenal. So the VRM checks out, the onboard audio checks out. Going through the rest of the features, we've got five PCIe Gen 4 slots, three of those being 16X, two of those being X1, and this will support uh, Crossfire 3-way and also NV Quad SLI with NV Link. Now this board will also support Thunderbolt if you get the add-in card. It has the Thunderbolt add-in connected down the bottom of the motherboard. And now going over the rear of the motherboard, we've got four USB 2 ports and below that a HDMI port and then four USB 3.2 Gen 1 and then one USB 3.2 Gen 2 Type A and then a Type C and then above that is an Intel Gigabit LAN which I tested the speeds out on this absolutely fine and then below that is your optical out and your manual 5.1 jacks with your headphone out mic in and also line in. Now going through some of the other features on board this motherboard they've got Q Flash Plus otherwise known as BIOS Flashback a thing that's coming out on pretty much every X570 motherboard. You've got seven PWM fan headers, as well as your 12 volt and five volt addressable RGB headers for RGB control. However, on this board, you will have to install the RGB synchronization software, RGB Fusion 2, which I have made an update to, but I will critique this. I do like the BIOS implementation, for instance, on the X570 Taichi that ASRock implemented, and I'd like to see Gigabyte doing that. But stopping through the BIOS, which is a very important part of any motherboard. And it's great to see Gigabyte and Aorus have stepped up their game, at least on this motherboard in particular. It's a lot easier to navigate now. You don't have any plus or minus voltages. You just lock in that particular voltage. It's easy to get to those settings and you can save up to seven different profiles and control the fan headers individually, making your own custom fan profiles and applying that to the rest of the fan profiles if you wish to. Now going through some of the finer details on this board, the top two 16X slots have what they call PCIe steel armor. So if you're into bending unsecured graphics cards and trying to break PCIe slots, this is gonna be a great solution for you. There's also a neat feature that they're offering two USB 3 outs for a total of four USB ports on a front panel. And also in addition to that, two USB two out headers for a total of four USB two ports, and then a type C out on top of that. Now going over all these details and testing out everything from the USB speeds to the NIC, to the onboard audio, to the VRM, leaves us to conclusion time with this motherboard. And what do I think of it for 269 US dollars? Well, it's coming in with a solid price point, especially when it comes to the VRM and onboard audio, which I think Someone getting a motherboard for this price will want those two things and they'll want them to work extremely well. And they're also doing an exceptional job of ticking both those boxes. However, like I said in the Tai Chi review, you are getting PCIe Gen 4 and you are paying for it this generation around. And exactly how many people are going to be using this first, how many people are going to be paying the premium for it, I'd say there'd be a big discrepancy there. But that aside, everything checks out on this board. The BIOS, it's great to see that Aorus have done a good job upgrading that. All X570 boards support Precision Boost Overdrive 2, and in the case of the Aorus Pro here, it did a fine job of pretty much finding the sweet spot on the 3900X. So basically, if you're not into overclocking, but you want the best performance out of your Ryzen 3000 chip, then this motherboard can do that, just like all the other X570 boards. But for me, there was only some very minor things to critique. I'd like to see a clear CMOS button on the back of the board, as well as possibly a power button and debug LED light on the bottom of the board. Though for 269 USD or 469 Aussie, they have made a board that works and it works exceptionally well. And with that aside, hope you guys enjoyed today's review. If you did, then be sure to hit that like button. And keep in mind, this is for the Wi-Fi version, what I'm quoting with the prices. So as for the non-Wi-Fi version, I'm told it may not even be sold in Australia. So I'm not sure there. I will update the description for you guys. But also on that note, let us know in the comments section below what you think of this motherboard, what you think of the Taichi. I'm getting the X570 motherboard reviews done for you guys, and I hope you're enjoying them. With that aside, I'll catch you in another tech video very soon. But on your way out, if you're enjoying the videos enough, sub button, ring the bell, it's down there, and I'll see you next time. Peace out for now. Bye.